If you're opening my script at the top there, it will say, oh, you can see now. It should say source and visual. Stick to source. Visual is not great for anything, really, but definitely not for the purposes of going through the script. Um, something else is be careful about doing too much when you're doing a visualization. I'm very much one of those people who put too many things in the visualization. I'm like, there could be shapes and colors, and the nodes are going to change, and the size, and that's never going to work because it's a story, right? Every picture is supposed to be a story. It's supposed to be part of an argument. Um, something else I want to emphasize before I start is that, and you know, Jim kind of said this already, there are two kinds of visualizations in my mind. There's the gut check visualization, and then there's the final visualization you're going to put in your paper or in your presentation with funders. Probably even that one works really well. Um, and so those are very, very different, and you're going to use different tools for it. I would not try to make the beautiful final visualization every single time you're making a visualization. If you're trying to gut check, a simple visualization is great. And most likely, I'm speaking from experience here, you're trying to procrastinate actually moving forward by making the picture nice. I know that. <laughs> but by making it simple, sometimes that's more revealing of that gut check moment. Um, and yeah, so there is, and also there's no true visualization. There are no true layouts. There's no truth to any of this. Um, it's not like any of it is a lie either, but it's all an argument. And so it's going to fit as a part of your story. Think about it like an argument. OK, so now let's move on to the R script here. So what we're going to do in this R script is mostly going to be how do you do this gut check visualization stuff. And then maybe I'll get us started like a tiny bit on some fun visual elements. But we're going to stick to the basics. Um, we're going to import a bunch of stuff up here, as we usually do. And we're going to be using, oh, there we go, all the warnings in the world. We're going to be using a high school network, which is a fake high school network that you've seen in a couple of other tutorials. So we're, and they're all coming from IdeaNet. Another great thing about IdeaNet is that it includes a bunch of different example networks that you can use, all sorts of stuff. So that's what I'm going to run here. I'm going to run NetWrite, which is part of the IdeaNet package. Again, this whole conference is just a big sales pitch for this. If you're not convinced at the end of this, then we failed at something. OK, so all iGraph objects, which is what we're going to be using here. So this net object right here is an iGraph object. You should be f deeply familiar with these at this point. They have a, a, a basic integration with the plot function that's in base R. And so we can take a look at it here. And you can see the first thing I'm doing is adding a couple of colors that I like to saying, hey, I want to take three colors out of this set of colors, and I want to color the nodes uh, by what sex the nodes are. In this case, it's a binary. And when we run that, um, that looks OK. And in fact, if you do a basic, and we can like blow these up a little bit. Um, well, there we go. That looks actually pretty decent, right? And I had to do a tiny bit of work. By default, I had to take away some of the labels. I had to maybe make some of the edges a bit more transparent. And that's pretty OK. Um, a couple of things that stand out here. The number one thing that you'll probably realize when you're plotting a network is that isolates and like smaller little pairings on the side will never really help you to tell a good story. Typically, not always, but typically, we'll be working with the main component or like the principal component in the middle, right? Um, that's not a hard and fast rule, but it allows you to focus a little bit on, usually we're also interested in the processes that are happening in that component anyways. It's more where the structure is happening. Yes? I, let's see here. I also, so first of all, that was all a test. I, it wasn't me forgetting, and you win, I guess. Uh, I also asked it to size the nodes by their total degree. So this is a directed network of a high school where students are nominating each other for friendships, right? So a total degree in this case is how many ties did they send out and how many ties did they receive, the sum of that. And so you can see kind of intuitively that the ones that are in the middle of this force-based layout, which is what we're using by default and what is mostly used by default, um, are bigger because typically centrality is associated with degree. Degree centrality is sort of one of the main measures of centrality. 
Uh, in this case, I'm laying it out with like a default force algorithm, but we'll be getting a little bit more into this. But I kind of want to get away from the basic R plotting since we don't have a ton of time. I want to focus on like the good stuff, which is G graph. Uh, for years, I thought of this as GG graph because of GG plot. Uh, but basically, this is the sort of traditional, the most used way to plot um, any kind of data in R is gplot, ggplot. Uh, this is the same language and the same strategy of layering things, but added for networks. So what do I mean by layering things? And if you're familiar with um, ggplot, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But we're going to start with one layer, which is I'm saying, OK, graph this network. I'm going to tell it what network I want it to graph, which is still this network. And say, lay it out with the same layout, the same force-based layout. We'll look more into those afterwards. And that's it. And what it's going to tell me is, like, I've done it. I'm done. <laughs> Not much there. The reason why is because this is expecting us to layer things on top of this initial image. And by layer things, I mean points, right? So points are usually how we want to think about nodes. So if I add a little plus sign here, now go to a new line and add geom nod point. I'm saying all those little nodes that were in the network add a point at the specific location that this four space layout would set them. Now again, this is not hugely useful because we don't know the connections. So we're missing still one more element. We're going to add the connection. So I'm going to add another plus sign up here. Go to the new line and add geon edge link. And if I add these. Now we have, we're much closer to an actual network. So you might ask, like, what is the benefit of this over the basic R? That's a little bit hard to put into a summary word. The basic R plotting, you can totally do with, but you're kind of fighting against the tide. This is starting you from a more basic level and asking you to work your way up. But as a result, you have much more control over what you're doing. OK, so let's keep going a little bit. Oh, we don't really like that gray background. The gray background is like making it a little bit harder to read. And so at the end of the layer, so you can see the first layer, we had nothing in it. We added some points. We added some edges. And now I'm going to add this thing called theme graph, which is basically just the aesthetics. And that's going to make it look a little bit more neutral in the background. So far, so good. Before we move on, I'm sorry if I'm going quickly. I'm trying to fit everything in, but pretty simple. Awesome. Like I mentioned at the beginning, you might have noticed this is exactly the same network that we had at the beginning, right? Same data. You can see it's the same layout, exact same thing. I mentioned that we had problems with all these things on the edges, which are really not giving us much better information. If you remember the visualization of the high school that is from Jim's original paper. Uh, they put all of these nodes on the bottom right. A good example of a gut check versus a paper check. If you were interested in this structure right here because you're interested in measurement, you have a problem with your measurement of the nodes, for example, you want to check the picture. You only want to check this main component because that's where most of your, the things you're measuring is coming from. You're going to ignore all of the ones on the edges. But in the final paper, maybe you want to add them all into a little box down here. That says, hey, this is how many dyads there are. This is how many triads there are, how many isolates. So this could be one of the differences between a final product and a gut check. The way we're going to take away all those, um, those things on the edges here is actually um, oh yeah. So we're going to grab just the largest component of the network, which is actually included in IdeaNet. So in IdeaNet, when you put um, your edge list and your node list and whatever other component you need. It's going to take out the general network with everything in it. It's also going to do a subset of the network that's just the main component. And it directed also the, the largest by component. And so that's what we're going to use here. And that's a little bit more visible, right? And these are all choices. You might want to keep the isolates and everything around as well. OK, so now we've actually constructed the network, and we're going to do exactly what I said you probably shouldn't do, which is we're going to add as many things on top of that 
but just because I want to show you it's possible, okay? But again, I want to repeat, the important part is, do I really need to add colors to the edges? That ma I see this in papers all the time. People will color the nodes, which is nice. That's interesting to see clustering of nodes. And then they'll color the edges the same color as the destination node or the node it comes from. That's not why. That's not necessary. I don't understand that. OK, so one thing that I'm bringing back in here is directionality. So if you notice here, at the very beginning, I said we're looking at a directed network, right? So if somebody nominated, one of the students nominated someone, that other person did not necessarily nominate them. In this representation of the network, I can't tell what direction the relationship is going in. So what I'm going to do to add in that relationship is I'm going to go into the layer that, where I did the connection. If you remember, it called Geom Edge Link. I had it up here. I'm not adding anything new, right? This right here. And inside of that function, of that, I'm going to add some arguments. And those arguments are going to change the aesthetics of that particular layer. So in geom edge link, open parentheses, and I'm putting some arguments. One of the arguments I want to put in is add arrows of a particular length, particular angle, et cetera, et cetera, and then make the edges a little bit more transparent. Same thing here in the points. I'm going to say add the points, but on top of that, Add color, a different color for each grade, and then change the shape depending on what sex they are, and then have a basic size for it. You can see here that I added another layer. This is where the metaphor kind of loses, because this is actually not adding anything to the graph, but it's modifying this layer right here, the colors. You can, and so these are all things that we can talk about later if you want. This is all sort of the ggplot logic. Um, but you can still think about it as layering things. So this is the two most important layers actually showing stuff about your graph. And then you're sort of modifying the aesthetics of it. The very last one is just removing the legend. What's alpha? Alpha is basically the setting that will determine how transparent the particular object you're visualizing is. So if you put it, if I had put it up here in the nodes, it would make the nodes more transparent. And I put it in the edges, it makes the edges a little bit more transparent. The reason that you want to put your alpha, alpha transparency on edges is nice is because when there's a lot of them that overlap and they're fully black, it becomes very, very messy very, very quickly. It's a nice thing to play with. OK, so now we have our high school network and we have a little bit more information. Uh, this is already starting to be a little bit useful, right? We can see some of the clustering by grade. These are all the seventh graders, really, really like clustered on their own. Yep, they're doing their own thing. You can see actually that like the, the seniors here, they're a little bit more spread out, which, which is interesting. Eighth graders are on their side. Um, we can maybe see some, some sort of sex things here. So there's a cluster of round nodes here that are all together and all seem pretty central to the seventh grader that are all female. So this is maybe the early mean girls setting right here. All the boys are on the edges. Um, and we have the little arrows, if you look, right? Arguable if whether or not the arrows are useful here, but depending on your use case, you might want to focus on one of these areas and, and look at the arrows. OK. Let's add some size here. I'm going to go back to adding size. But this time, instead of you know, adding just total degree, I'm going to add in degree. And that's because when I looked at this picture, I was like, oh, I'm interested in this group. This, I feel like the mean girls metaphor, all social networks people go to all the time. But it's true of social life. So, And now, nodes are going to be bigger. The, the, the more um, people nominate them, the bigger the node. right? So you can start to see who the popular kids are. And maybe my story isn't so great. There's some, a really popular guy out here. Maybe this is a, the, who said the deviant group? I can't remember who used that term. I find that pretty funny. There's a really popular eighth grader. So we're starting to, starting to add some information here. But you can look at this too. And another thing that you can notice is that there seems to be some people who connect grades. right? There's these bridges here. And so you can start playing around with, maybe I'll put a, a score that better reflects those kinds of bridges. So in this case, I'm going to score the nodes by betweenness centrality, right? So this is what I'm putting right here in the size argument. 
But notice that I'm also multiplying it by 2. And that's because between the scores tend to be smaller. And you know the, the graphing backend doesn't really understand how to scale things necessarily. So it needs to be scaled in a way that makes sense. And usually that's like, like integer points, like 1 to 10 or 1 to 20. So I'm going to multiply this so that it's a little bit more understandable to the graphing software in the background. And now we have like some more information. So you could tell maybe a different story about who has high between the centrality and the school. OK, we have seven minutes left. But the point is, is that that's the iterative process you want to go with. This is the gut check thing. Like, what is interesting about this high school? Is my theory about this high school true, interesting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, layouts. This whole time, I've been using this layout KK, who stands for Kamada Kawaii, I think. Um, you can play around with those. There's all sorts of layouts, hundreds of them. You can just Google and play around with them. Um, one, there's some that are a little bit more dif that are different, that are not force-based. And Jim showed some of them in his presentation. Uh, here, I'm going to pull out data from a tech firm. And, I'm, and it has multiple relationships that they ask these employees. One of them is, who do you seek advice towards? So instinctually, when you're like, OK, my network is people in an organization, and the connection is, who do they seek advice from? You're thinking, probably some sort of hierarchical visualization is going to be useful. You can see here, I'm still using GGraph. But this time, I've changed the layout to Dendogram. And I've set a direction. And so instead, what we're going to get is something that's maybe more useful. And you could work on this to make it a little bit better, especially in terms of the labels and where they are. Um, but who's asking advice of who? Right? In a force-based layout, this wouldn't maybe make as much sense. Although maybe in this case it would. Yeah. What's making the hierarchy of the graph network? So in this case, it's the in degree. Okay. So this person, sorry, it's the, I believe it's the in degree. Yeah. Yeah. You said cumulative? Yeah. OK, thanks. Whenever an algorithm is trying to do a hierarchical layout, it, for when it, its first go-to is to use a directed acyclic graph. If your graph is not a directed acyclic graph, it might try, it'll essentially start deleting edges until it gets as close as it can to a directed acyclic graph and lay out based on that. And so usually that'll mean we're deleting edges. Um, uh, if we're deleting the, the, the purposes of layout, del deleting the edges that are the least likely to have other edges coming into them. And so it creates this. And there's often a little bit of noise in it. So it's possible if you run this again, I don't know this particular layout algorithm, but it's possible if you run it again, you get a slightly different ordering, unless your network is strongly higher. OK, thanks. That, I learned something today. <laughs> the one thing I will say that you experience with this sometimes is there's different sort of choices they can make about the source. Right? So like which person, so th there may be people who are comparable or like structurally equivalent in this advice network. And so which, which sort of branch it decides to go down can shift. And it will actually give you a warning and tell you. I mean, using something like this, so there's, there's like six different hierarchy layouts in iGraph native. It's, the, the convention is layout underscore width method. And so there's a bunch of them in there. And one of them is something like, I, I, don't, I don't know the dendrogram one, but there are a number of different ones that have been organized around organizational charts. And so if you didn't know which organization with you where they were, these things would probably do a pretty good job of telling you who's in charge of who. Assuming it, with, you know, modulo the accuracy of your data. Okay. There's like an empirical question, right? Like if you don't know someone's job title, but you know how many people nominated them for advice, then that's a really good marker of who's in charge. Although maybe you'll have a surprise, you know, and somebody who's, you know. I've been trying to get Duke to give me the organizational chart for the university. <laughs> They won't let that thing go for it's like because as soon as you can see all the layers of hierarchy and administrators at the university and people who aren't useful in that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Dude. I'm being audio recorded. Um, 
Yes, and then so my example, my following example was what if we're looking at people who are friends? So this is the exact same data set, but I'm pulling of this multi-layer network. I'm pulling who is friends with whom, right? And I'm also going to look at it as a dendrogram, the sort of default dendrogram. And it's doing something, um, but it's maybe not as useful. Although in this case, you know, you can maybe find some interesting stuff. But you can see this person is flying over to 127. Maybe a four-space layout would be better. Okay. So I mean, it's, a, it's a whole fascinating field of graph layouts. And it turns out that this kind of problem is really hard to do. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the, the simultaneously optimize the ranking on a, on a hierarchy and minimize the edge crossing. It's a really difficult, it's akin to the clustering problem for community detection. It's just really hard to do. And to make it then readable. Yeah, it's, this is, do not interpret me as saying that the people who do this aren't doing a good job. <laughs> this is just really, really tough task. Okay, so. I wanted to move on to one more thing because I know a lot of people are interested in ego networks. We've got one more minute, so I'll show you an ego network. Okay? There is a package, an additional package, I know, called TidyGraph, um, which basically allows you to manipulate your network, uh, whether that's a StatNet object or an iGraph object, in particular ways that are useful. And it has pretty good integration with this package we've been using, the GGraph package and allows you to do something. So you, you could have done this without TidyGraph, but I'm giving you code that I think does this efficiently. The idea of what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing our network, our original high school network, and I'm saying, for the, um, give me all the distances that nodes have from the node that's labeled number one, that has ego ID number one, right? Give me all those distances from that node. And then I'm saying, lay out my network so that we're focusing on person number one. Okay, and then I have a couple of other aesthetic things that you're welcome to go through and, and if you want to copy them. And then you'll start to get things like this, right? So you can focus on specific parts of your network and then say, how far do I need to go to capture the entirety of the network? It's a sort of a way of, there's measures that will capture this, like how far does one node have to go to capture the entire network, right? This is a way of visualizing that. Um, and that will work great for if you have an ego network. Right? It doesn't necessarily need to be an individual person inside of a network. An ego network is, a, a full network is just a compilation of a bunch of ego networks in a lot of ways. So, Last thing, and then we'll go to barbecue, is that you might want to facet your data, which means you might want to split your visualization into multiple different visualizations that are subsets of the data you're looking at. So in this case, for example, I'm just going to run through these. You might want to split it by the node attribute. Are the nodes male or female? In this case, we're looking at the network from the point of view of the women in the network and from the point of view of the men. You can see that there's a clear difference in the structure of the network from each of those perspectives. Right? You can see that like, like really dense clique here for the women in seventh grade. You can also facet by edge attributes. So are they different kinds of edges? In this case, we're going to go back to the Strazis and, um, and the, uh, the Medici, right? Um, so on the left hand side is the network of the Florentine families, their business ties, and then on the right hand side are their marriage ties. That can be really useful when you're comparing, you know, you have, a, you have an inkling that maybe those two things are going to be correlated, maybe. This is a good gut check. Or maybe they're different in a specific way. Maybe some people are more central to one and, or to the other. And then you can do interactive stuff. So I'll just leave you on this is what um, sort of an example of what, let's see here. What, this is the Medici families and how their marriage ties are moving and dissolving. So this is the kind of thing that you can do the dynamic network. OK, I don't want to keep us a single extra minute. I know everybody's like, please let me out. <laughs> but if you have